Well, thank you for continuing to follow us through this wonderful study, God's Mission, My Mission. We are on lesson number nine, Mission to the Powerful. There are powerful people in every community, at every level, every educational level, every financial level, people that somehow are known for their ability to speak and everyone listen. Does God have a plan for their lives? When you study scripture, you'll find out that God used the powerful. Many wealthy men in the Bible were used by God. Today, we're gonna to be covering that topic. How do you minister to powerful people? Before we go any further, to my immediate left is Daniel Perrin. Good to have you here, Daniel. Thank you. I've got uh, the powerful man named Naaman on Ooh, Monday. That's a wonderful one. And Shelley, how are you today? I'm doing great. I have witnessing to the learned Nicodemus. Mm, that's a challenge. Those degrees sometimes <laughs> give you degrees of yes. challenges. Ryan, good to have you today. Amen. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Mission to the Rich. Okay, and James, what do you have? I have Thursday's lesson, John, and that is entitled Mission to the Powerful. Ooh, wow. Right. This is going to be a good lesson because you may have people in your sphere of influence that you might think, man, would they even listen if I spoke? They're my supervisor. They run the company. They own the business. Mm. Those are individuals that also need Jesus. Before we go any further, Ryan, would you have our prayer for us today? Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask once more for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in this study lesson, Lord. We dare not move forward in our own thoughts and ideas. We ask humbly that you will uh, pour out your Spirit upon us, that everything that is presented here will be in accordance to your will and your word, and that each and every person uh, attending this this uh, meeting, Lord, or, or watching across the world that will be blessed and drawn to you. May we all be educated, informed, and of course, brought into harmony with your will found in the Word of God, we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 You know, I'm glad that this topic was included. I know that we are talking about powerful, powerful, wealthy, educated, uh, influential, mm. and uh, people that we sometimes walk into their building and their name is on the building or we see them fly overhead and that's their helicopter, or they land and their name is on their plane. Mm -hmm. And I was reading not too long ago in the book, Christ Object Lessons, into the chapter, into the highways and hedges. And uh, there was a wonderful illustration that Ellen White talked about. She says, if a wealthy man was drowning, would you allow him to drown because of his wealth? Mm -hmm. If a person who was influential was uh, sick, would you not visit them because of their influence? or their powerful position? And the answer is no. And so when the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that includes the powerful, the wealthy, the educated, the influential. Let's go to the memory text for today. And this is a wonderful text to lay the foundation. In Matthew 16, 26, most of us know it by heart. For what profit is it to a man if he gains what, friends? Mm -hmm. the, world. the whole world. Yeah and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mm -hmm. I've been to the bedside of many people that were challenged by health. Some of them were about to pass away. I've never heard anyone say, you know, I wish I had more money. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I had a faster car. I wish I had another degree. When people are at that point of life where it's slipping away, all of a sudden life becomes sharply focused and they begin to think of those things that are really relevant. It's sad to get down to the end of life and realize that all your possessions cannot earn you salvation. And in the focus of this lesson, we're talking about how important it is for people not to be possessed by their possessions mm -hmm. or distracted by their accomplishments or known by their degrees, but recognized by their need. Now, one of the ones that are very significant is a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Who doesn't know who he is? Well, maybe somebody watching today never heard that name. It's a name when I learned it, I couldn't forget how to spell it. Let's go to the book of Daniel. We're going to peek into this man's life. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and people listened. You might remember him if you've studied the story of the Babylonian captivity of the Hebrews there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was in power when they were... Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were led into captivity in Babylon. And he was the kind of king that when he spoke, people listened, except when he tried to impose upon these Hebrew worthies the diet that they were not used to. 
or the images of worship that they would not bow down to. And many of us have heard the song that children sing, Dare to be Daniel. 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 Mm -hmm. Dare to stand alone. Daniel did not allow influence nor power to sway his allegiance to God. And so when we look at the Bible, there is a segment of society today. Some of us live in neighborhoods. Maybe our churches are in neighborhoods where wealthy people live. And we wonder, how are we going to reach them? Look at what they're driving. Look at, look at how they live. Look at the size of their houses. We get enamored by that sometimes. And we think, how are we going to reach them when they have a no solicitation sign on their front porch? How are we going to get them to their neighborhoods? Well, we're praying that 3ABN has some impact through digital media and television and internet. In the lesson, it points out the rich and powerful of the Bible times were no different from the rich and powerful in modern times, especially in their pursuit of wealth and fame and power, often but not always at the expense of the vulnerable. They go on to say in the lesson, this week we will explore God's mission to the rich and powerful. Journey with us as we see how God reached some of these people and how he is calling and preparing Seventh-day Adventists to be witnesses to them today as well. Amen. Some of the wealthy people in the Bible, do you remember the man by the name of Job? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you look at the possession of his cattle and his houses and his sheep, innumerable, but still Job faced some of the greatest trials. Another man by the name of Abraham, and his nephew name. They had so much they had to separate mm. so that their herdsmen and their cattle would not get intertwined and cause conflict. Then you have Solomon. When you read about how Solomon's mm. temple was built, which was intended to be God's temple, you think, do I know anybody with that kind of influence and that kind of wealth? A wealth that didn't shrink, but it just kept growing as all the leaders of other nations kept pouring into his coffers more and more. Mm -hmm. Then you hear Joseph who wasn't wealthy by standards of inheritance, but man, he rose to a position of power in the land of Egypt. And then David, an influential man who had difficulty in his own reign, but still he would be classified among those who are powerful. The evidence of God's desire to save everyone is found in some of the following verses. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. You know, as Adventists, we believe in something called unlimited atonement, Meaning, when Jesus died, his blood was shed to save everyone. Not just those who are second and third generation Christians or Adventists or Pentecostals or whatever they may be, but everyone born under the impact of the nature of Adam. And believe me, it stems from the wealthiest to the poorest. The evidence of God's desire to save everyone is found in the following verses. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many men? All men. All men. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Bible talks about how difficult it is sometimes when you think about uh, wealth. One of the stories that come to my mind is a story that's so apropos and significant to this lesson, the rich young ruler. Mm -hmm. And he came to the Lord with his riches and his youth and his vibrance and his determination. He wanted to be saved, but his possessions possessed him more than his desire to be a follower of Jesus. And then you also find this impact of all God desired to save also is emphasized in Titus 2 and verse 11. Let's look at that. God's grace is for all men. The Bible says, for the grace of God that brings mm -hmm. salvation has appeared to how many, Daniel? All men. To all men. All. And we see teaching them, de denying in godliness, they should live soberly, godly, and righteously. But sometimes it's hard to say to a wealthy person who can speak and everybody moves, who can just think of an idea and the building goes up. It's hard for them to sometimes think that they have a need. I've had opportunity to hobnob, if that's the word I could use, with billionaires, being in a car with two or three billionaires. And, but men who are humbled and involved in God's work, and I've discovered it's not the wealth that's the issue. Sometimes it's the love of money. Let me say, not sometimes, but all the time, it's the love of money that becomes the root of that evil. Mm -hmm. We find also God has no desire for anyone to be lost. Let's look at 2 Peter 3, verse 9, dealing with the importance of the wealthy. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that, how many? Any, any should perish, but that all should come 
to repentance. Mm -hmm. When you study the life of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you find, as we go to Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was a man who was so proud of his accomplishments, and he was warned by God. God said, I could humble those who are proud, and I could exalt those who are humble. And one day, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 to 37, we talk about one day he stood on his porch and he says, is not this great Babylon that I had built? And the judgment of God was bestowed upon him. That's a light way of saying it, mm -hmm. imposed on him. And for seven years, he remained as God ordained, as a beast in the field. His hair was growing, his nails were growing, and the symbol was a ban around the tree. But at the end of the seven years, his reason returned to him. And I'm going to read about that. Daniel 4, verse 34 to 37. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Here's what he discovered. Here's what he learned. And all wealthy and powerful people should not forget this. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. What a declaration. Amen. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And Nebuchadnezzar noticed, wait a minute, Babylon is just my small little kingdom in my backyard, but God owns the earth on which Babylon stands. And then verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. You see, God gave him back what he had when he humbled himself. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now, I love this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. <laughs> what a testimony. Mm -hmm. He knew that personally. And those of you that may have a lot of means where you look at your bank account and you have to do nothing for your bottom line to continue going up. You wake up in the morning and you'll never live to spend the kind of money that flows into your account. Here's what the Bible says about those who need to understand God's desire to save them. You see, we here at 3ABN believe the everlasting gospel is for everyone. And as we continue proclaiming that, we are reaching out to those who are wealthy, those who are powerful. We are all in need of the redemption of the Savior that came the world. Bottom line, he owns everything, but he does want your heart. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lomakang. Those three letters and that one word there that you highlighted all, right. perhaps among the most challenging right. of words to really grasp in the gospel story. I want to take you uh, to Monday's lesson on Naaman. I'm Daniel Perrin with Monday's lesson. And uh, we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 5 is where we're going to find this story. And as you're turning there in your Bible, I'm going to read to you 1 Timothy 1.15. Just a couple of words here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Mm -hmm. Now Naaman, general of the army of Syria and lead harasser of Israel, he was a sinner. So what did Christ Jesus come to do for Naaman? Mm. Bring him salvation. Let's look at his story in verse 1, chapter 5, 2 Kings, uh, full of glowing credentials for him. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. In other words, Naaman is a part of inner circles. He's never got to find a, a parking space for his chariot. He never has to wonder if he's got enough change in his pocket to make things work. People compete for the, the privilege of serving Commander Naaman. He's got it all, he's rich and powerful, but then it doesn't matter what your status is, it doesn't set you apart from the common calamities of life. These three words at the end of verse, Verse one, but a leper. Hmm. This brings his life to a screeching halt and emergency. What is going to become of me? There's no reasoning or purchasing power or, or military might that can get him past this. Brought face to face with his own mortality, which reminds us why it is so important and needful for the ministry of healing, God's way. 
uh, to be applied because it cuts across, the need cuts across any social class. Everyone needs healing. And uh, you think about this, this man, uh, Naaman, who most people in Israel, the common people of Israel would target him for assassination. Mm. And hmm. God targets him for salvation. Amen. He's got a solution in the form of a slave girl. The little maid, as she is sometimes called, what a blessing it is that God has humble instruments who are willing to be used. I want you to hear this uh, statement in Ministry of Healing, page 473. If the Lord desires us to bear a, to Nin a message to Nineveh, it will not be as pleasing to him for us to go to Joppa or to Capernaum. He has reasons for sending us to the place toward which our feet have been directed. At that very place, there may be someone in need of the help we can give. He who sent Philip to the Ethiopian consular, uh, Peter to the Roman centurion, and the little Israelite maiden to the help of Naaman, the Syrian captain, sends men and women and youth today as his representatives to those in need of divine help and guidance. God had something in place already. And this little girl fulfills a purpose that all of Israel was to be fulfilling, mm -hmm. turning the eyes of the people to the God of Israel, the God who has power. And she, this is a testament to her early education of her parents that her parents gave her, but she then speaks to Naaman's wife. And she has such a character that this wife listens to her. And she speaks to Naaman and he trusts her, he, he trusts her. Mm. And then Naaman goes to the king of Syria and all on, on this girl speaking out, all on her testimony, mm. they decide to reach out to their enemy, to Israel, mm. a letter to the king and is sent and said, we want healing through your prophet. The king receives this letter in verse six and seven and he doesn't have nearly as much faith as this little slave girl. Mm. And he tears his clothes and says, oh, he's trying to fight with me. Mm. Oh, what am I gonna do now? Well, Elisha hears about it. Naaman is summoned. Naaman comes down to Elisha there in Samaria where Elisha's home is. And Elisha doesn't even come out and talk to him. Just sends a message and tells him to go wash mm -hmm. in the dirty river Jordan seven times. Seven times complete submission to the God of Israel. Verse 11, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Naaman's got a battle here with mm. pride. <laughs> He's got his proud spirit. Nonetheless, uh, he humbles his spirit and he submits to what God has asked him to do. And then in verse 15, he comes back, returns to the man of God, he and all his aides and came and stood before him. And he said, indeed, now I know there's no God in all the earth except in Israel. And Jesus actually refers to this when even his own people in Luke 4 reject him. Mm. Naaman's response here is, is decisive, it's rational. He turns his life over to the God of Israel as far as he knows with as much information as he has. He perhaps would not understand everything ever, but he says, based upon what I know, I'm all in with this God. Mm -hmm. And so he makes a request in verse 17. So Naaman said, then if not, all right, send, if, if you're not accepting my gift, he offers to pay the prophet, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. I'm turning my back on those gods, still doesn't have a, a right theology about how it all works, but he says, I'm not offering, I'm not serving that God any longer. Mm -hmm. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there and he leans on my hand and I bow down in the temple of Rimon. Then when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Now the actual name of this God is Ramanu, the thunderer. This is uh, an incarnation of, of Baal, the God of, of rains and things like that. And he uses a, a different name. He calls him Rimon, which means a pomegranate. All right, I'm done with that. There's no power in there. It's just a little fruit, okay? But when I go in to that, to that temple, I'm not worshiping that God, please. In other words, he says, pardon me here. There's some problems with this request in the Christian life. As Christians, when we, ask, when we make a covenant with God and we ask him then to overlook sins in our life that we hold on to, 
we're not really submitting to God. Mm. Or if we as Christians know that there's a clear decision between my work or my social life and my Lord, and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to choose this instead of you. Can I still have your favor? Mm. It doesn't work out in the Christian life. And when we as Christians uh, do not abstain from even the appearance of evil, as, as we've been told, then we're putting ourselves in a wrong condition with God. Now, after saying all those things, that makes even more striking Elisha's response to Naaman right here. Verse 19. Elisha said to him, go in peace. Mm. So he departed from him a short distance. Look how gently the prophet deals with Naaman, who's just taking first steps in his faith. Naaman has made a commitment, a huge sacrifice to uh, turn his back on the gods of Syria and yet return there to his position and, and be honestly a missionary to the Syrians. He demonstrates his conviction. He recognizes the moral authority of God. He desires to be in right relationship to him. He's a, a, a new believer taking first steps and Elisha does not want him to depart in doubt or uncertainty and he returns his attention and to the peace that God has brought to him through what he's just done for him. The implications for ministry here, put ourselves in other shoes and realizing the big change that turning your life over to Jesus requires of people. It's not a small thing. I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and I think Seventh-day Adventism in my family goes back a number of generations, six or seven or eight. There are people for whom there is an enormous change and changes take place slowly. And therefore, we can't always hold people to the same exact standard of exactly you have to do everything just like I do it. Instead, number two, we affirm each step that somebody makes as they're turning their life over to God, even a small step. And even it's a step where they're, they're fumbling along and doing it in a way that might appear clumsy to us who have more knowledge of the Bible. And yet we say, praise the Lord, for we see that you have turned from darkness to light. And there's always for each one of us more turning to be done. And then number three, there is a right time for each appeal. The SDA Bible commentary on this story says, Elisha knew that this was not the suitable moment to insist on a drastic change in this particular matter of behavior. He was a man of keen spiritual insight and his treatment of Naaman wished to be tactful and prudent. So he sent him away, not with a word of rebuke, but with a message of peace, similar to that contained in Jesus' farewell to his disciples. John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you. Mm -hmm. And then number four, God does not always Always ask people to leave their position, even in this world's business. John the Baptist in uh, Luke 3 verses 12 to 14, tax collectors come to him and say, what should we do? And uh, he says, collect no more than what is appointed mm -hmm. to you. He didn't tell them to quit their tax collecting business. And soldiers, Roman soldiers asked him, what shall we do? He didn't say, leave the Roman military. He said, don't intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to push people farther than God is pushing them. I want to share with you this uh, statement here in Prophets and Kings, page 253. Today in every land there are those who are honest in heart, and upon these the light of heaven is shining. If they continue in faith in following, continue faithful in following that which they understand to be duty, they will be given increased light until like Naaman of old, they will be constrained to acknowledge that there is no God in all the earth save the living God, the creator. There are people all over the world in his condition ready for turning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. I love that, mm -hmm. how he was so gracious to Naaman the leper, former leper. Mm -hmm. Well, we have three more lessons to cover. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our Sabbath School lesson as we continue 
in Mission to the Powerful. Shelly, it's oh, on you. Oh, yes, I'm excited. Mine is Tuesday's lesson, Witnessing to the Learned. It's a story of Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was like the Supreme Court of Israel. He was a rabbi, a teacher of Israel. And his vaunted knowledge of scripture was really kind of a twisted, misconstrued idea. Now, he kept all of the commandments of God, but he still had a great spiritual need for a savior. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus one night, and here is the story in John chapter three is where we are. John chapter three, we're going to go through verses one through 12. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now that's a big statement from a Pharisee. Most of them trying to trip Jesus up. They're, they're not appreciating. But Nicodemus was impressed by Jesus' teachings and his miracles, his heart. There's some kind of conviction going on here. He says, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So we see this heart that is beginning to uh, bubble up with hope and conviction. Jesus, in verse 3, answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does he mean? God's kingdom, God's word, are spiritual words. They are spiritually discerned. So the convicting power of the Holy Spirit can come upon us and show us that we need to turn. But no one can see the kingdom of God unless the Holy Spirit is indwelling them. So Nicodemus says in verse 4, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, now, now it's going to be different. First, no one, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. Listen to this. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be able to see before you enter. That which is born of the flesh, Jesus said, is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell it, that it where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Let me hit a pause button here. When Jesus is referencing the wind, he's giving the emo, the modus operandi uh, randi of the Spirit. The Spirit's everywhere, and you don't see Him, but you will feel Him. This does not mean that the Spirit is just some energizing power, and I want to be clear on that, because Jesus said of Himself, I am the door. That doesn't mean He was the door. Um, verse 9, Nicodemus answered Him, and he said, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do you not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Mm. This is interesting. Born again. I remember the first time I heard that. 
I, I grew up in the Church of Christ. We never talked about born again. It was kind of a Baptist thing at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought that doesn't make a lot of sense, but I was very young. I was a teenager. But you see, the first birth, we're all descendants of Adam. The, the Acts tells us that all nations come from one blood, from the man of Adam. Mm -hmm. That's the first birth. That's the natural birth. But what is happening when God came down and became a man and then he died for us? The Bible says in John 1, 12, that as many as receive him become the children of God. You are adopted. You are born again. Mm -hmm. And God is now making a new nation out of the one blood of Christ Jesus. You become right. a, a, a descendant of Christ Jesus and this spirit to be born again, this spiritual transformation. God gives us a new heart and he imparts new life to us. Listen to 1 Peter 1.23. I've always loved this scripture. When, when we've accepted Christ as our Savior and Lord, 1 Peter 1.23 says, we having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of of God, which lives and abides forever. Mm -hmm. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter two, you he made alive, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. So when we accept Christ, John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And then verse 13 says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, this is interesting. Nicodemus has this tete-a-tete -tete with Jesus. He, his heart is believing in Jesus, but his pride prevented him from openly confessing Jesus mm -hmm. as Lord still that night had a great impact on him. And we see later that he supports Jesus by his words. He defends Jesus. Let's look at this in John 7. This is sometime later. John 7 and verse 43, it says, there was a division among the people because of him. And now some of them in the Sanhedrin wanted to take him but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priest and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers said, no man has ever spoken like this man. They sent him out to bring, drag Christ in. And the Pharisees said, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now Nicodemus, who's present at this meeting, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Mm. And they answered him and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So Nicodemus is supporting him, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but not openly confessing, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But Nicodemus did honor Jesus at his death. Let's look at John 19. John 19, 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds, pretty expensive. Uh -huh. Then they took the body of Jesus. They bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom was for the Jews to bury. So the bottom line is God knows the heart of the learned. The knowledge of the truth is not enough to save us. We must be born again. We must 
-hmm. enter into that relationship, enter into covenant with Jesus and into the relationship as a covenant child of God and then walk mm -hmm. in loving loyalty and obedience. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Shelly, Daniel, Pastor John. Appreciate you guys so much. I'm Ryan Day. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Mission to the Rich. And, you know, it's the common idea from some people, especially those who are not rich. Uh, it's the common idea that, you know, you know, it, it, rich people in general are, I guess, bad or not interested in spiritual things, or we tend to keep away or I guess almost shun the idea of witnessing or ministering to the rich, but uh, that's not the case. And we're going to learn through this today, through this lesson that yes, riches can be a hindrance to salvation depending on the person who has the riches, if they allow that to be so. But we are still to share the gospel. We are still to be mission-minded towards those who are powerful and wealthy and have much riches. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 19, begin in verse 16 and onward. This is the story of the rich young ruler. And uh, this is an interesting story indeed. Kind of a sad one uh, because obviously we know Jesus' heart was to save this rich young ruler, a young man who obviously was interested in spiritual things, but yet his riches had more of a powerful grip on him than did his desire to actually be saved ultimately when Jesus had given it to him. And so in this case, we're going to start in verse 16, Matthew chapter 19. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may enter or have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Uh, and he said to him, which ones? And I just had to pause there because, you know, we, we live in a culture today where so many people have that mentality of, you know, it's certain commandments we have to keep and certain commandments we don't have to keep. At the end of the day, my friends, we keep the whole law. That is the Ten Commandment law of God. There's not one that we are to leave out. But in this case, the mentality of this rich man was, well, maybe there's some I don't have to keep. Maybe there's others that's a little bit more important. Which ones, Master? Tell me which ones. And then Jesus actually, he knew this rich man's heart, right? Jesus could see into the very soul of this person and knew exactly his intentions. And, you know, I've had some ministers even say, and especially when it comes to the, the concept of Sabbath keeping, they'll say, well, you know, notice what he said here. He said the commandments, but he quoted the last six. He didn't quote the first four. Well, in this case, I would submit to you, Jesus didn't quote the first four because this man was no doubt a devout Orthodox Jew. He would have definitely within the culture of Israel that had been at that time very much established in bringing glory to God and keeping the Sabbath and making no other gods before him and not taking the Lord's name in vain and not worshiping idols or images, but it was those last six that he would have had issue with. And that was his relationship with his neighbors. So Jesus went directly to the commandments that was associated with his relationship and his idea and association with those around him. And so he starts quoting the, the, the commandments uh, in the latter part of the commandments. That is the last six dealing with relationship. Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, you shall love you your neighbor as yourself. Now it's interesting that last statement sums up those last six commandments because they're all about our relationship with others. And he knew that man's heart. He knew that there was something about him that he did not love his neighbor enough to be able to share what God had blessed him with. And so notice what the young man's response. He's, he's, he's completely uh, oblivious to his own condition. The young man says to him in verse 20, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And so Jesus gets right to the heart of the issue to reveal to him his own condition. Verse 21, Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. Do you love your poor brethren out there? Those that are struggling, those that don't have much, those that are in need, what are you doing for them? He says, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Not only did Jesus tell him what he should do, but he, he extended the invitation. Go sell what you have, give it to the poor and come follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. Verse 22, but the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. 
Hmm. So Jesus' interaction, the lesson brings out with the rich young ruler just shows how dangerous a trap wealth can be. And, and, and you know, Jesus would go on to say a little in a few verses later in verse 24, he says, and again, I say to you after the, the, the disciples begin to question him, he says, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I want to make clarification here. Did, did Jesus say it's impossible for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. No, because we have examples in the Bible of rich men, wealthy individuals who indeed uh, we will see in heaven. But this brings out the fact that while it doesn't necessarily mean that, that rich people cannot be saved, it simply means that if they are not careful that their riches can be, as the lesson says, uh, impendent to salvation, it can become a hindrance if they allow their greed and their desire. What does the Bible say? Not that money is the root of all evil, but their desire for wealth, their desire for the money, their love for it is the root of all evil. And so in the end, the rich and the poor, and this is the point, the rich and the poor face, face the same fate. Doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter how wealthy or powerful you are, at the end of the day, that rich man and that poor man is going to experience the same fate, and that fate is death. And that should bring a reality to us that no matter how wealthy you are, don't always think, and I, I know some people have this mentality, we have to be careful, don't think that just because you are abundance and have a lot, that somehow that equates, kind of like uh, the twisted mentality of the Pharisees that somehow that equates that, well, God must be blessing me. That must mean that I'm in good favor with the Lord. That doesn't always mean the case. Yes, you are blessed, but that does not mean that your heart is right with the Lord. There may be something that you still need to surrender to him. That may mean that you may have to give up something for the Lord and to be in, in, in tune with him and be prepared for the kingdom of God. Now we go on and quickly read another story. I may not read all of it uh, because we don't have enough time, but we see a story, a different story of a another rich man. Many people don't, don't, uh, don't uh, catch this, but the story of Zacchaeus, the Bible says he was a rich man. Mm. In fact, notice what it says here. It says, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. This is found in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, be behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So Zacchaeus was rich. And it says, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd for he was a short man or he was short in stature for he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass uh, for Jesus was going to pass that way and when Jesus came to that place he looked up and saw him and said Zacchaeus make haste and come down for today I must stay in your house Jesus knew he knew the heart of this man he knew that he needed to minister to this rich man and he knew that this rich man Zacchaeus uh, was ripe and ready to be ministered to and so it goes on to say in verse 6 so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully, but when they saw it, they all complained. Now they've noticed the people complaining. Hey, what are you doing, Jesus? This this man goes on, and now he's 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 made he's made a friendship, and he's he's communing with sinners. Mm. Of course, this of course that's what Jesus came to save. Jesus came to save sinners. Zacchaeus is a, a, is of no exception, even though he's a rich man, and obviously he accepts Jesus as Lord, as we're about to read. We know that he was a sinner in need of salvation, and so Jesus is reaching out to this man of influence and to this man of power. Verse eight. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, Lord. I I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I had taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Notice the contrast here between Zacchaeus the rich and of course the rich young ruler that we read about earlier. Zacchaeus had a different heart. He saw that while God had blessed him, he still felt the need to take that which God had blessed him with and he gave to the poor. He was not tied or bound or a slave to those riches. And my friends, I just want to bring this out. You know, it, we live in a culture today especially here in the American culture. And I know there's people watching this that may not necessarily live within America, but it's also a world culture. And that is, we live in a day and age where we seek, seek, seek for more, 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 more. And sometimes we're never happy or content with what the Lord has blessed us with. Especially here in America, we have this thing called the American dream in which you know you have to keep pressing, keep fighting, keep pushing for more and more and more. And I'm not saying, and I'm not preaching here that, that riches are necessarily a bad thing or that you should not save or that you should not try to seek financial stability for your family and have a savings and, 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 and do that which is good on a financial level. But we have to be careful. The 
lesson is teaching us uh, that you know we have to be careful and not let the riches of this world or the, the abundance of which the Lord has allowed us to be blessed with to hinder us from having a relationship with Him. And on, on the flip side, we should not take upon ourselves the idea that just because someone is rich and wealthy that, well, they're never going to listen. They're never going to hear the gospel. You never know when a person's heart is ripe and ready to hear the good news because Man. you, God may be sending you to witness to a Zacchaeus. And so make sure that your heart is right with the Lord. But at the end of the day, we go back to our one of our key verses, Matthew 16, verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? My friends, make sure that we are grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ, in his word, that no matter what we have or no matter what kind of financial uh, situation we find ourselves in, Jesus is the foundation of our life. Amen, amen. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. We never know. We never know when God is seeking to use us to reach the rich and the powerful. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Thursday's lesson, which is Mission to the Powerful. And the quarterly tells us that Jesus knew how to make friends with po the powerful. He was admired, he was respected by many people, and at the same time, he was despised by many. The powerful people in the Bible who came to Jesus for help surely sensed that he cared for them, i.e., right, Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. Also, many of the rich and powerful did not openly come to Jesus right away, Nicodemus, right? They waited until they were, they were certain that Jesus was truly the Son of God. Such was the case both with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. So the text we have here is in Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 to 60. We're just going to read a couple verses here. It's talking about Joseph of Arimathea. And when even was come, there was a rich man named, uh, uh, of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate. He begged the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth. So there was a, a situation that developed after Christ was crucified. And the situation was that everyone had kind of disowned Christ. Even his disciples had left him. And when a person is crucified and no one claims the body, basically that body is just going to be dumped somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so in steps Joseph of Arimathea, right when the disciples needed him. In fact, right when Jesus needed him, in a sense, Jesus has passed away, of course, and the disciples aren't there for him, in comes Joseph of Arimathea. We never know when God is going to work on the minds and the hearts of people in powerful places to fulfill his mission and his cause. And so we need to keep our minds open. That's what I've been hearing here on the panel as we've been going through this lesson. We need to keep our minds open to the way God is going to work. You know, there are some biblical principles that we can look at. And we'll just go back to the book of Daniel. Uh, Pastor John, you were there for a little while. Let's go back to the book of Daniel chapter 2. And let's just look at the principles that can help us to understand how we can minister to powerful people in practical ways. In Daniel chapter 2 specifically in verses 13 through 19, we see Daniel in a predicament. Daniel is a faithful man of God. He's purposed in his heart to serve God, and yet he finds himself classed with the wise men of Babylon who've just been uh, told that they're going to die. The death decree has come to them, and Daniel and his friends are going to die also. And if you can imagine what it would be like to face a death decree, just think about that. A death decree has come to you, and you're thinking in your mind, I need to call my lawyer, uh, I need to call my family. I, is there anyone wealthy that I could call that could help me in this situation? <laughs> I'm facing a death decree. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel focuses entirely on the king himself. He seeks to understand What's troubling the king? Sometimes when we're in situations where we're in a crisis, that's the opportunity for us to be other-centered and other-focused. And it's in that moment of time that we can make all the difference in someone else's life. Mm. And this is what happens with Daniel. Right. He says, what's troubling the king? Maybe, maybe I can help the king. Maybe there's something I can do to help this powerful man who's just determined that I'm going to die. And of course, after that, and that's practical lesson number one, sometimes we need to find out what troubles others, especially powerful people. They're filled with troubles. And when you look at the powerful, and we look at the rich, when you look at the famous, yeah. and you see 
how many of them are on drugs? How many of them commit suicide? How many of them, you know, seem to have this life that is just torn to shreds and can't even go out in public without being pursued and, and hunted almost? Mm -hmm. You realize that, that they need some sympathy. They need some love. They need some care, compassion. They need people to intercede for them and, and to care for them and think about them and not just talk about them and gossip about them. And, Right. and look at them as though they're some kind of uh, aliens because sometimes that's the way we treat rich and famous people. They're just normal people, just like us. And Daniel has this care in his heart. And not only does he reach out to the king, but he finds out what's troubling the king and then he goes and has a prayer meeting. And that's what we're all about as Christians at 3ABN. That's what we're all about. We're all about bringing names, bringing people, bringing circumstances, bringing situations to the Lord in heaven. So let's have a prayer meeting for these people. I just heard about this one guy. I just heard about this other guy. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for them. We need to intercede. In fact, the Bible tells us we need to pray for all men, for kings, for prime ministers, for presidents. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, for yeah. those who are in authority. We need to be praying. You know, the other thing we need to recognize is that Daniel, when he's brought in before the king, as the dream is answered, as his circumstances is brought to a place where Daniel can help him, mm -hmm. he lays aside any glory that is to come to him. You know, Arioch even says, I found a man. And Daniel says, there is a God in heaven. That's Daniel right. directs the king to the Lord. You know, Hezekiah messed up on this point. Yep. Daniel directs the glory to the Lord. He says, there is a God in heaven. Whenever we're in contact with people, especially powerful people, what we want to do is we want to take every opportunity to introduce them to the God of heaven. And this is what Daniel does. You know, it's not natural for us. We're inclined to give a little bit of glory to ourselves. you know, but here we're going to have to make some special effort to eclipse ourselves. Now, Daniel chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, some more practical lessons, how to reach the rich, how to reach the powerful. We need, in Daniel chapter 3, 25 and 26, we need to live the truth. All right. Uh -huh. Nebuchadnezzar heard about the truth, but he backslidden. Just a few years ago, he was in, in Daniel seminar for the first time. He was the first <laughs> attendant at a Daniel seminar. He was sitting on the front row. The, the evangelist Daniel gave the prophecy, gave the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I want to I want to join your church. I want to join your church by profession of faith. I'm going to join by profession of faith, right? He wasn't really baptized. He wasn't really immersed. He wasn't really like dead to self. There was still a little something in there. So he joins by profession of faith. A few years later, ah, he's kind of forgotten some of the details of the truth. And so another test comes to Daniel's friends. They stand for the truth. And when they stand for the truth, when they're standing in that fiery furnace, and friends, you've got to remember, sometimes it's in the fiery furnace. Sometimes it's in the heat of test and trial that we're going to have the opportunity to witness to the rich and the powerful. And mm -hmm. believe me, that's going to take place in Revelation chapter 13 at the end of time for sure. And so these men are not just talking the truth. We can do a lot of talking, but they're living the truth. And when they live the truth, this rich and powerful man sees Jesus among them. He sees the Son of Man. He's looking in the furnace, and there he sees the Son of Man with them. Mm -hmm. Jesus, people need to see Jesus in us, mm -hmm. right? They don't, they don't just need to have us talking about Jesus. They need to see Jesus. And so this is one of the ways we can reach, reach powerful people is to have them see Jesus in us. You know, talk, talk is, is paper money. Living truth is gold tried in the fire. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Daniel's in another predicament. Daniel has been called in before Nebuchadnezzar, who's dreamed another dream that no one can interpret. And, and Daniel now is, is in a friendly relationship, a much more friendly relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. There's no death decree at this point. And Daniel is brought in, and Daniel is given an understanding of what the king dreamed, and he has to interpret it. And Daniel struggles, verses 19 and 20, because he realizes this dream is not so positive. And sometimes we have to be faithful to give people information, truth, and understanding that isn't necessarily going to be the most positive and may mm -hmm. not be well received. Right. And Daniel is, is, is talking to the king and he's saying, you know, this, this isn't for your, this is for your enemies. This is something your enemies are going to rejoice at. And nevertheless, right. even though he seems reluctant to share and that reluctance comes out and, you know, it's good to be reluctant. Some of us don't have a reluctant bone in our body. When we're trying to reach people, especially powerful people, we need to be a little reluctant. We don't just want to hammer them over the head. Daniel's a little reluctant, but at the same time, he's still faithful to share the dream. That's right. right? He, uh, to share the interpretation. He's still faithful to communicate the truth. We need to be faithful if we want to reach the powerful. And then Daniel chapter 5 
you know, here's a man that cannot be bought or sold. He's offered the trinkets of this world, you know, to interpret meeny, meeny, tickle, you farce him with Belshazzar. And he says, you know, you can have your position, you can have your title, you can have your honor, but I'm still going to tell you the truth. We mm. need to be faithful in spite of the trinkets of this world. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel has a personal faith time with God and it's vital. If you want to witness to the powerful, if you want to witness to anyone, you've got to make sure that that prayer time is foundational, that communion with God, that connection with God, that, God, that abiding in God, that, that um, uh, dependence on God. Daniel, Daniel is willing to sacrifice his life rather than give up that prayer time. And then Daniel chapter 9, we need to recognize, and Daniel does in Daniel 9 and 10, that we're faulty, that we're imperfect, that, that when Daniel sees Jesus, he falls down, he says, there's nothing good in me. When Daniel prays, he says, I'm not just going to pray for, for their sins, I'm going to pray for my sins. Daniel allows himself to be part of the problem that the nation has fallen away, and Daniel says, we have sinned. We have not obeyed. We have turned away. And so Daniel recognize, recognizes his own faults, his own mistakes. He knows his imperfect. I mean, when you meet people, don't come across as though you're better than them, that you're, mm. you're something and they're yeah. not anything. You know, as yeah. Pastor John was saying, let, let, don't come across as, as religious. Be a real Christian. Yeah. And those doors will open when you have an interest in others. There are two challenges here in this lesson. I'm going to save them for uh, the recap because I'm out of time. Okay. Thank you, James, Ryan, Shelley, Daniel. Summarize your day. One final thought here. When there is no meaningful outreach going on in Naaman's gated community, God sees a man of faith and he allows him to feel his need and he introduces him to the gospel through the minimum wage day laborer working in his house. Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus said you must be born again to see and enter the kingdom of God. Are you? How do you know? Romans 8.14 tells us that if we are led by the Holy Spirit, we are the children of God. Mm, amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, no one is good but one, and that is God. Uh, that reminds me of my constant need of Him. Uh, some people were led to believe that, you know what, I'm a good person, but at the end of the day, we're all sinners in need of Jesus Christ. So give your heart to Him today if you have not done so. Amen. Challenge, uh, add someone to your daily prayer list who's in a position of power, uh, not a believer, someone you could come in contact with from time to time and challenge up. Address a letter or an email to someone in a position of power, even if it is someone that you may never have met and tell that person that you are praying for him or her. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this challenge and I'm encouraging you. Do the challenge, pray for those who are in positions of power and influence. That's right, and remember the most important thing, mission to the powerful is possible by mission through the all-powerful. Mm. His right. name is Jesus. Lesson number 10 is entitled, Mission to the Unreached, Part 1. But don't forget this, for we brought nothing into the world and it is certain we carry nothing out. Mm -hmm. May God bless you. That's 1 Timothy 6, 7. Until we see you next time, have a powerful day in Christ.